The bare minimum we owe our soldiers and their families is the truth. That didn't happen for two of the most famous soldiers in the Iraq and, Afga and Afghanistan wars. For Jessica Lynch and Pat Tillman, the government violated its most basic responsibility. Sensational details and stories were invented in both cases. Sometimes because of the fog of war, the first reports from the battlefield are inaccurate. But that doesn't seem to explain what happened here. In Jessica Lynch's case, the first reports were right. It was the follow-up stories published 10 days after her capture that discarded the facts and misled the country. The Washington Post published a front page story on April 2, 2003. It was written by Vernon Loeb and Dana Priest, and it got the story right. I want to read the lead paragraphs. Jessica Lynch, a 19-year-old private first class missing since the ambush of an army maintenance company 10 days ago in southern Iraq, has been rescued by special operations forces, defense officials said yesterday. CIA operatives in Iraq located Lynch in a hospital near Nasiriya, where she was being held because of multiple wounds, officials said, and a helicopter-borne team of Navy SEALs and Army Rangers rescu rescued her about midnight local time. That was an accurate statement. But the next day, April 3, the Washington Post ran another front page story. This one was written by Susan Schmidt and Vernon Loeb, and the contrast with the April 2 story is remarkable. Here's what the Post reported. PFC Jessica Lynch, rescued Tuesday from an Iraqi hospital, fought fiercely and shot several enemy soldiers after Iraqi forces ambushed the Army's 507th Ordnance Maintenance Company, firing her weapon until she ran out of ammunition, U.S. officials said yesterday. Lynch, a 19-year-old supply clerk, clerk, continued firing at the Iraqis even after she sustained multiple gunshot wounds and watched several other soldiers in her unit die around her in fighting March 23, one official said. Where did this false information come from? Jessica Lynch was captured on March 23. The Washington Post published a completely factual article on her rescue on April 2nd. But then they went on 10 days after her capture. U.S. officials had become the source of a report that riveted the nation, but twisted the truth beyond recognition. It's four years later, and we still don't know who's responsible or why they did it. All we really know is that they did a great disservice to Jessica Lynch. And so I want to say to Private Lynch and her family who are here today, this committee is going to do its best to find out the source of the fabrications that you had to endure. We want to know whether they were the result of incompetence or a deliberate strategy to spin a compelling story at a critical time. And we'll do our best to find out who should be held accountable. Well, members who do not serve on our committee are joining us for the hearing today, and I'd like to ask unanimous consent that Representatives Hayes, Honda, and Mitchell be allowed to participate in the hearing. And without objection, that will be the order. They will be um, permitted to ask questions after all members of the um, committee have completed their questioning. Ms. Lynch, we're pleased to have you here. And what, be sure the but button is pushed on the base of the mic. And I'm reluctant to tell you to pull it too close to you, but see whatever is comfortable. Chairman Waxman and distinguished members of the committee, it is an honor to be here with you today, and it's, I'm grateful to have this opportunity. I think you better pull a little closer. Is it? Okay, thanks. Is that good? That's yeah, good. <laughs> I have Thank been you. asked here today to address misinformation from the battlefield. Quite frankly, it is something that I've been doing since I returned home from Iraq. However, I want to note for the record that I am not politically motivated in my appearance here today. I lived the war in Iraq. 
and today I still have family and friends fighting in Iraq. My support for our troops is unwavering. I believe this is not a time for finger pointing. It is a time for truth, the whole truth, versus hype and misinformation. Because of the misinformation, people try to discount the realities of my story, including me as part of the hype. Nothing could be further from the truth. My experiences have caused a personal struggle of all sorts for me. I was given opportunities not extended to my fellow soldiers, and I embraced those opportunities to set the record straight. It is something that I have been doing since 2003, and something that I imagine I will have to do for the rest of my life. I have answered criticisms for being, told, being paid to tell my story. Quite frankly, the injuries I have will last a lifetime, and I had a story to tell, a story that needed to be told so people would know the truth. I want to take a minute to remind the committee of my true story. Now, I was a soldier. In July of 2001, I enlisted in the Army with my brother, Greg. We had different reasons of why to join, but we both knew that we wanted to serve our country. I loved my time in the Army, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to have, a, to have served the country in a time of crisis. In 2003, I received word that I would be deployed. I was part of a 100-mile-long convoy going to Baghdad. I drove a five-ton water buffalo truck. Our unit had some of the heaviest vehicles, and the sand was so thick that our vehicles would just sink. It would take us hours to just travel the shortest distance. We decided to divide our convoy up so the lighter vehicles could reach our destination. But first came the city of Nazaria, and a day that I will never forget. The truck I was driving broke down, and I was picked up by my roommate and best friend, Lori Paestua, who was driving our first sergeant, Robert Dowdy. We also picked up two other soldiers from a different unit to get them out of harm's way. As we drove through a Nazaria, trying to get turned around to leave the city, the signs of hostility were increasing. There were people with weapons on rooftops and street watching our entire move. The vehicle I was riding in was hit by a rocket-propelled grenade and slammed into the back of another truck in our unit. Three people in the vehicle were killed upon impact. Lori and I were taken to a hospital where she later died and I was held for nine days. And all 11 soldiers died that day, six from my unit and two others were, t six others from my unit were taken prisoner plus two others. Following the ambush, my injuries were extensive. When I awoke the Iraqi hospital, I was not able to move or feel anything below my waist. I suffered a six inch gash in my head. The, my fourth and fifth lumbar were overlapping, causing pressure on my spine. My right humerus was broken. My right foot was crushed. My left femur was shattered. The Iraqis in the hospital tried to help me by removing the bone and replacing it with a 1940s rod that was made for a man. Following my rescue, the doctors at Launstuhl, Germany, found in a physical exam that I had been sexually assaulted. Today, I still continue to deal with bowel, bladder, and kidney problems as a result from the injuries. My left leg still has no filling from the knee down, and I'm required to wear a brace just to stand and walk. 